But just to start off, basically, you know, this is a uh, Royal History Project for East Wilson. And basically, we're trying to get some perspectives on this area of Wilson, you know, what's happened here and, you know, people have lived here and how they have seen things change over the you know, past few decades. And so we basically we've tried to speak with people who've lived here, who have family here, and like I said, can offer a little bit of perspective on that. Because um, first thing we'll ask you, if you could just please tell us her name. I'm Gloria Freeman. Freeman, okay. And how long have you lived here in Wilson? I was born in Wilson and uh, lived here until 1972 mm -hmm. and uh, returned here in 2012. But always lived in the state mm -hmm. and frequently visited back and forth with family and holidays. So forth. So I've stayed in close contact with Wilson. Of course, I know your last name is Freeman. Yes. What is the relation? I am <laughs> the daughter of Charles Freeman mm -hmm. and the granddaughter of Julius Freeman, who is the namesake of uh, Nestus and Julius Freeman and, and six other male members of the family. Okay. Julius Freeman. So we go as far back as the original Julius. Mm -hmm. I think he was born in 1847. I've heard a rumor that he got to America on a slave ship, mm -hmm. the last one. I, I'm not sure that that's mm -hmm. accurate. I, when I look at him, he does not hearken back to Mother Africa right. completely. So I'm not sure if that's a myth or not. But what you know is pretty much all your family was from this area. Uh, the original right. Julius from Johnston County, mm -hmm. um, but yes, more so this Wilson area. In fact, where we are now, the street has been altered, but uh, Nash Street went all the way to 301, mm -hmm. which is just a couple of blocks up. And we lived on the south side of Nash Street, my immediate family, my father and his six children. Um, and we lived on Freeman Street, which is didn't seem odd to us at the time, but now I can see some significance in it. That house has since been demolished, but um, that side of Nash Street seemed to be the Oliver Nestor side. My grandfather, Julius, property was on this side where we are now towards um, the Carroll Street side. So um, he was a teacher of trial trades. His uh, training at Tuskegee was in masonry. My father was also a mason, brick mason. And um, he helped build some structures, helped uh, con construct rather than as Nestus did, you know, having this unique signature with the rocks. Mm -hmm. He was more of a brick mason mm -hmm. and um, helped build the post office as one, one building I know for sure that he did. And the, the original post office that is, and I think the courthouse. The one that's standing now? The one that's standing now. And probably some others that I don't know about. Right. Um, now that you mentioned you, you said you left here in the early 70s. But you might ask, you know, what, why did you leave Wilson? Oh, and he yeah. came back. Well, <laughs> yes. Um, I left uh, with my husband at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, we lived in Brown County, and I finally uh, spent a few decades, a couple of decades, 20 years in Durham. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I retired, I came to Wilson, came back to Wilson, which was always my intention. Right. Mm -hmm. And one, one thing, I, I'll just kind of bring it out there, we've been asking a lot of other people in these interviews, you know, how has this community changed mm -hmm. from especially, you know, during the 60s and our civil rights movement, you know, through the 70s. You were gone for, God, what, what, 40 years or so and then came back. I'm sure you made, you know, a lot of visits back here, but how, Actually, how, it, how has the community changed? Okay. I, I was in my early teens mm -hmm. in the 60s, right. in the mid-60s when everything was happening. Mm -hmm. I had a cousin, a female cousin who was at Bennett, my brother was at Shaw. They were active in the movement. Mm -hmm. And I remember very well my female cousin, Faye, coming back to Wilson and we had a march from the First Baptist Church to, I guess, the courthouse somewhere mm -hmm. up there. And 
she was instructing us, it was almost military. Mm -hmm. Men on the outside, you know, ladies on the inside, and this pace and that, and you could see the experience of demonstrating right. civil disobedience. So, uh, and not only that, but that kind of um, civil awareness, civic awareness was something that was passed down. My own grandfather, Julius, I understand, refused to accept the secondhand desks that were sent to his classroom. He just wouldn't have them. They didn't even let them come in his building. Um, so there were, there were incidents of that kind of disobedience or rebellion, if you will, um, that spirit that is within the family, at least certainly down my line, and I, that's what I can speak to best. Um, so there was this um, feeling of things were not as they should be. And after that, the high schools in 64, there was in North Carolina a freedom of choice. I think it was 64. And without a thought, I never deliberated. It just, so I just wrote down, fight high school. Mm -hmm. No, you know, and my grandmother didn't object. She didn't instruct or direct or advise. She asked me, what did I do? And I told her. So it was all good. At that time, Flight High School was a brand new school, wasn't it? I don't know if it was new or not, right. but I knew it was a white high school. Mm -hmm. And we had a chance to go. Yeah. And uh, so I left Darden High School, a historically black school, in the like ninth grade. So I started fighting in the 10th grade. Well, what was the community like before that? We had businesses. We had leaders. Uh, we had people who, who, who we could go to and who had helped us. Mr. and Mrs. Miller were, you know, excellent role models. Um, we had classes in etiquette. We had Girl Scout. Um, my cousin, Mary Frances, this all was a uh, daughter, was very instrumental in that because her mother had been employed by the Washingtons, and they were known to know how to do things correctly, and uh, how young ladies should behave. We had um, a civic club, we had the Mary McLeod Bethune Civic Club for women, and then we had the Marion Anderson Young Ladies Civic Club for the second generation. So there was organization in the community. And um, we just felt a sense of family or familiarity, uh, if, if nothing else. And the community was divided across the highway, which is this way. That was a section. My, my uh, maternal grandfather lived across the highway. The, that maternal side of my family lived out that way. And as I say, we lived this way. And um, Uncle Nessus lived there. And we just took it for granted. That's just, as I recall, um, we had those organizations, the uh, Young Men City Club. They sponsored people to college. They gave little scholarships and stipends. And I think that organization still exists. But after integration, all of that seemed to fade and, and get, get, get downplayed. It was just a little bit lower on the cultural scheme of things, I would say. I guess, I guess it was like, you know, during the days of segregation, you know, basically the community had to do everything for themselves. That's right. You know, like, you know once integration came through, everything just kind of oh, yeah. went away. Um, I guess, from my perspective, seeing things, you know, or maybe from yours, you know, was that a good or bad thing for the community? The, the, the way it ended up. I think it ended up with um, probably more losses on our side, on the side of the people in East Wilson, the people of color here. Mm -hmm. And there are remnants of it. Right. There are certainly remnants of that. Mm -hmm. And we still have leaders and we still have people who are you know, active mm -hmm. uh, and interested in the community. But I think in terms of economics, um, there's probably been a loss. Not a total loss because we still have, you know, businesses uh, 
rise in businesses and, and whatnot. But as far as the culture and the integrity of the history, I think it has been you know diluted, and that's why we need this building and the picture, the pictures of these people we have on these walls. To remind us that you know we we were always here. Right. We were always here, and there was some minor integration, and I would expect that that probably was from the West Wilson dipping into East Wilson mm -hmm. rather than vice versa mm -hmm. on the business level, because we had highly educated teachers. The high school was the um, center, the hub. And the teachers in the high school were very well qualified and were able to manage at a, at a, at a big scale at the bank level. And some of them were able to get on boards and, and this kind of thing very slow, trickle, trickle, trickle. But because it was a nationwide uh, time of change, it didn't just happen to Wilson. It was happening everywhere to our generation. And young people were just ready for it. When I went to fight, we had three black students. Patricia Fitch was a senior, Ernestine Fitch was a junior, I was a sophomore. By the time I graduated, we had, I don't know how many students of color. I mean, it was just, all you had to do was get one, and then everybody else was ready to come. So, in integration here within Wilson, I guess, was kind of seamless. I mean, there were, were there that, especially in, in schools, did, did, did it finally work its way through over a few years or were there? I think it was a sort of a benign neglect. Mm -hmm. I won't say it was seamless, mm -hmm. but uh, sports came into play. Did that help things? Well, it helped those who played sports. Right. I mean, you had the 1964 Darden High School uh, back, uh, base basketball team, football team, all won the state championships in our regions. Of course, we did not um, play white teams, but that didn't mean we didn't have good players. Right. So coaches don't care, mm -hmm. I don't think. And uh, as soon as they were able to uh, convince some, some black athletes to come into the scene, I think that sort of loosened things up. Because, you know, how do you play on a team with somebody that you can't respect or you feel you are? And I'm sure there was a lot of that. But my feeling as the only black in all of my classes for the first year was sort of a numbness. It was okay if you speak to it. It just wasn't a personal thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't go looking for friends. Um, I may have made some, I think possibly, you know, they knew I was there but they just sort of neglected to really give me any particular attention. You know, they sort of, you're here, but that's okay. You know, you're not going to, my whole social life just collapsed. There was no social life for me. Was this all through high school, the whole time you Well, were by there? the time I became a senior, uh -huh. right. there were a few more, there were some couple of, we, I think they pulled straws for who was gonna take who to the prom <laughs> my last year. Right. And um, my prom date, approached me this way. He said, whoever the other senior was and I looked at who was, who could we take. Right. And he decided on this one and, and he, I, I have you. <laughs> Something to that effect. Right, right. You know, we got together and talked about it. And it could be that that was the first year that the prom was integrated. You know, I really don't know for sure. Right. Because, you know, if they that I think there might have been a conscious effort to say, okay, we are going to the prom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, about school colors. Mm -hmm. Now, that's interesting um, yeah. that we were just discussing that a little bit. The school colors at fight were gray, mm -hmm. Confederate gray. <laughs> right. Wow. They didn't change. Mm -hmm. I, my graduation picture mm -hmm. is in a gray uniform, robe. Mm -hmm. And obviously Dixie right. was the, the pep song of the band. Wow. And I, this is why I say sort of benign neglect because no one took our interest at heart. Mm -hmm. None of the teachers, white teachers, you know, seemed to, history teachers even, you know, it looked like they would have said, well, you know, maybe we ought to change something or the principles or whatever. Mm -hmm. Not that I was ever mistreated. Mm -hmm. 
course, we had some discussions over the pronunciation of the word Negro. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of blew over, you know, without too much consequence. Mm -hmm. I do remember when Dr. King was killed, I was just so frustrated. And I didn't know what to do. And then I just went and sat under a tree. I didn't go to class. I just sat under a tree on, on the campus. And I think the first and only time that the principal had ever spoken to me was he came out there and said, what, what did I want? What was wrong with me? Huh. It should have seemed obvious. Right. Yeah. But um, whatever the case may be, that's, that's the part of it that I remember. Right. So I don't think we got any uh, help. Mm -hmm. Now, once the faculty integrated, which was my, my junior year, yeah. uh, and it integrated with a French teacher. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, the, the Darden uh, faculty lost its French teacher. Mm -hmm. And as that went on, and of course, always the best go first. Mm -hmm. So, and not that all, all the teachers weren't good, but there were some who apparently, I don't know if they decided, I don't know if the school board assigned them, I don't know how they got over there. But one by one, they started coming. Now, were you still living here whenever Darden closed? I think I was about to leave. Mm -hmm. I graduated in 1968. Mm -hmm. I think their last class was 1969 or 1970, somewhere in there, because there was a half year, mm -hmm. somehow or other. And I don't really know how that works. Somebody could probably tell you. But there were some people who graduated in like 69 and a half or something along that line. Now, do, do you remember or re recall at all, you know, I guess with integration, was Darden pretty much put on the chopping block because of that? I think everything black was really? just just allowed to go away. Nobody wanted to pay attention to it. So really there was no integration into the black schools, it was just the white schools that was basically how it was. Early on, at, at some point I think Darden did begin to receive some white students. Mm -hmm. I believe it was a 10th grade school. It was just all 10th grade. Right. So everybody in the 10th grade went to Darden. Mm -hmm. But I was leaving about that time. Right. I was, by then I was sort of out of that high school scene. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't, I, I and that's the last of it being a high school, mm. whenever it became an all 10th grade school. Right. And now I think it's just a, like 7th or 8th or something grade school. Yeah, that, that's right, that's right. But among the black schools, we had these A's, like a double A and a triple A, mm -hmm. and maybe a 1A, 2A, 3A. That was the way the schools were identified based on population, I think. Mm -hmm. And we were, I guess, a 4A school. And among the 4A schools, Darden High School was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Every black high school was a big deal in its county. Mm -hmm. And of course you had the best of everything that was black. Right. So you had some good things going in and coming out. Mm -hmm. Smart students. We had some brilliant students. Musicians that went on to be professionals. You name it. Doctors, lawyers, we, we, all of that came out of black schools. Now, I guess it was just, like I guess it instilled that in everybody to be good. Yeah, the best that you can. Right, exactly. And to understand that nothing is going to be given to you, that it's going to be a struggle, that you're going to have to do better than everybody else, la, 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 I hated that so bad. <laughs> then it would seem to me once your integration, you, you didn't, I guess you didn't have a lot of the black faculty like you had no, at the schools no, to indeed. help reinforce that. No one. No. Mm -mm. So I, I guess in your case it felt like you were kind of on your own in a way. You were, That's you cool. were. Yeah. As I said, when the choice just came to me instantly. There was no forethought. It was just, I'm, I'm going to do this. Right. And. That might be a personality trait or a genetic something, I don't know. Um, but I will say that I had one teacher that first year at Fike who made a difference. She was an English teacher. Um, and she gave me decent grades mm -hmm. in English. Mm -hmm. I think she, um, I don't know, understood, or pre it, she just didn't seem to have a problem with me being black in her class and being treated like everybody else. Right. So I remember her well and she, she made me think that I could be good at writing. Do you remember her name? I'm trying to come up with it right now. 
I do not. But she herself was kind of a, a free spirit. Right, right. I mean, we, we kind of could, you know. The, I, I don't know what to say my relationship with my classmates were at fight. I would love to know what they thought of me. <laughs> um, but we were just students. We were just high schoolers. And it's just, but so, you can only be, but so estranged. Right. Now, I, I don't think the boys ever thought that they could speak to me. Mm -hmm. I don't even know that any any of them ever passed a word. I don't know what they thought. Mm -hmm. But the girls, you know, there were, you know, women are much more inclined to, you know, be free friendly mm -hmm. and so forth. Right. So, um, we, we did sort of have that. And, and I would say that there were a couple. But that lady, I don't remember her name, but, but what I'm getting to is sort of as a non-verbal, even if you're not having a dialogue, you're not speaking to each other, you don't, you know, I think they didn't want to get to where it looked like they were too friendly, you know, or they were trying to make me their friend or whatever. Um, but I think it was generally understood that she was, something was behind her, you know, she right. had more than just what she was bringing to the classroom. Right, right. Um. Now you said you grew up in off of uh, Freeman Street. I was born on Freeman, Freeman Street. My father died in 1960, mm -hmm. and we moved from Freeman Street up to my grandfather's house on the corner of Washington and Carroll, which was like night and day. Really? That's a big two-story brick house. We had we had a little three-room inway um, house. No no comparison. Right. My, my grandfather was a teacher up there in high school, you know. My grandmother had 13 good-looking, smart, um, mischievous children. So everybody had one of them in their generation, right? you know, in their class. So it was just, you're one of those Freemans, you know. I can look at it. I know you're a Freeman. <laughs> Are you a Freeman? So-and-so was in my class. And with eight sons, you know, they had to get in trouble. <laughs> they had, they made a reputation. They were they, they they were popular with the girls, you know. So and it was a friendly thing. No, no nobody was you know upset. It was just so many of them. How was that neighborhood growing up? Well, the neighborhood on Washington Street. Th this was a this was a time in my life when I'm leaving uh, a very close neighborhood. Freeman Street was maybe. Um, two blocks long, mm -hmm. from Powell Street to uh, what the, Wainwright Street there, mm -hmm. and we were close. I thought we were. I mean, I still have those friends. It's been a long time, but I still consider them as friends, and I consider that we grew up together. Um, and there were big families, right? Uh, and there were just a few families, the Dawsons was one family. Um, we had the barns came in a little bit. But the street was so short that, you know, you were just up and down the street all the time. And outside. So you didn't you were always somewhere with somebody playing jack rocks or <laughs> getting in the mud barefoot or I remember when they put water, the water uh, pipes in the street right. and we jumping over the <laughs> ditch and that type of thing. It was just youth, you know. But when we moved here it was different. Across the street was the principal of the elementary school, you know. And that right there was a, you know, that was kind of put you in check. And then down the street was, you know, the history teacher, or, you know, the social studies teacher. And down there was somebody else, and it was a much longer street. And I really don't remember any children living on that street, because mind you, I'm with my grandparents now. And all of their children, had come and gone. And um, so I grew up with a lot of cousins. Mm -hmm. We had about 43 cousins, <laughs> first cousins. And um, we, would, we would travel. We did do that. We would go to New York one time, and we would go to Maryland a lot. We went to Virginia. They would come home because we were living with their mother and bring their children. So uh, we even had um, an aunt who lived in New Mexico, and they would come. And that's a that's a big thing, you know. Somebody see a yellow or red license plate, and one <laughs> New Mexico. Where is that? Right. <laughs> so there was always something going on around the friends. There was always something going on. Now, does a lot of that family still live live here? In this area? Not so much. Not so much. 
Now, my immediate family all live in North Carolina now, as of this year. Uh, all of us live here. I had two brothers who have been here for many years, my older brother and my youngest brother. The youngest brother never really moved out of the state. He retired uh, from the Army, but his family stayed here. And uh, my oldest brother, Charles, uh, moved back here many years ago. So he's been around. In fact, he doesn't live in Wilson, but he lives in North Carolina. He lives in Kenley. And two other brothers have now moved to Wake Forest. My sister moved back, and then I moved back. Okay. So we're all back here. I was going to ask you, obviously being a Freeman, did you ever spend any time in this building here as a child at all? This building was on the corner of Freeman Street. Mm -hmm. And it was behind Mary Francis' house over here, this cottage. Mm -hmm. So it was right there all the time. It, this is what I'm saying. It was just a roundhouse. Right. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> right. Uh, to us, to to my parents' generation, it may have been something different. Mm -hmm. But by the time I came along and my siblings, it was just a roundhouse. Mm -hmm. And we actually had a house that my father was building uh, that was directly on the corner. And that we called the wash house mm -hmm. because it had running water. Mm -hmm. It never was completed because he didn't live to complete it. But it was the neighborhood. And you would walk by Uncle Nestor's fence, which backed up to where the roundhouse was. I guess that would be Freeman Park now or the other side of the street from Freeman Park. And you would see his um, um, stuffed deer, you know, and you could, if you got in the backyard, you could see the fish pond and the koi. You know, people just didn't have that. And, and you, anywhere you go, when you say that, it's, it seems like somebody will relate to some folks. There's so many of us. And some moved into Rocky Mount. A lot of people thought that Nestus was an anthropologist, what we were called an anthropologist, that he was a, you know, an explorer, and he was of sorts. But um, I don't know where he had got that taxonomy from, but he, he, he did it. I don't know how he cast that that concrete dinosaur out there, but he did it. And um, not being, I guess you would call him a uh, entrepreneur. He was like my grandfather was contracted to teach over there at that school, so he didn't have the same liberties. But Uncle Ness is just he could just walk the town. He could walk around and find stuff, pick up sticks, rocks, bones, whatever. And he just made himself, you know, happy and, and did what he wanted to do. Uh, do you have any recollections of him at all? Absolutely. You do, really? Oh, yeah. Long beard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, as I say, he, he seemed to me to be just sort of a, um, a Renaissance man, I guess you could say. Again, now he didn't have all these children that my grandfather had. Right. <laughs> so it was a little bit easier on him, perhaps, you know, to sort of move around and well, you know nobody had a car I don't remember he had any vehicle nor did my grandfather so everybody everything was on foot mm -hmm. but uh, I, I had read his history and I, I've heard some stories but I certainly remember him out there in his front yard mm -hmm. doing whatever he did you know trimming up his trees or picking his fruit and that was Uncle Nestor's <laughs> Not that we sat down and had any long conversations or any heart to hearts, but I knew who he was. I don't remember us necessarily having Christmas together mm -hmm. or any of that. Uh, one thing, my grandfather was primitive Baptist, so he had a whole different, and, and Uncle Nestor's and Aunt Willie were Presbyterians, which I am now. So they had a sort of a different path, mm -hmm. I think I would say that's correct. Then, but his wife and my grandmother were friendly, and you know, were friendly. It's interesting you mentioned something about the church. I was going to bring that up next. Um, and did you grow up in a church here? I grew up in all these churches. Really? <laughs> I grew up in all these churches. Whatever church was happening right then, that's the church I went to. Right. I was not compelled to go to any church. Mm -hmm. As I said, my maternal family are uh, missionary Baptists. Mm -hmm. 
and we, we spent a lot of time there. My grandfather was, uh, I will say, important in that church. He was very, very dedicated to that church and had been, I guess, since forever. Um, he was well known, well respected, and so we spent a lot of time there. In fact, that's where we would go for vacation Bible school. And I learned something in vacation Bible school and got to know a few people, and I liked that. That was, that was neat. Uh, my grandmother, who raised us, was Presbyterian. So when we moved there, naturally, when she would go, we would go. If we didn't want to go, we didn't have to go. Nobody ever made us go. And sometimes, even if she wasn't going to church, I had cousins who were um, uh, in the Methodist church. I'd go over there sometime. That's where they were going. And we would, when the preacher started preaching, we would leave and go down to Mary's Cafe <laughs> and wait for the service to be over. Just a gang of teenagers. Right. First Baptist Church we would go to sometimes if we just wanted to go, sit up in the balcony and just be in church. Right. So I was never compelled or, you know, made to go to any particular church. Right. But I went to all of them. Like I know this, you know, reading stuff, you know, Pat, you know, a little bit of past history that, you know, especially during those years, the church was real big in the community and it was kind of like the glue that held everything together. Was it, was it for you or your family? Now that would not be my generation. Right, not at all. That would be my grandmother and grandfathers. Mm -hmm. I would think that that probably was. In fact, I can tell you, my, um, the pastor at my grandmother's church used to come and play pinochle. Mm -hmm with my aunts when they would come, aunts and uncles when they would come home. I learned how to play piano for like <laughs> 10 or 11 or right. You know, nobody knows piano. You, you, you can play some piano? Please. <laughs> so we were, there were things that they brought because my uncles and aunts all lived all over the world. Mm -hmm. Not just New Mexico, mm -hmm. but you know, ones in the service lived overseas and mm -hmm. They brought wives, and it didn't start with that generation. Even my grandfather's generation, his brother, uh, Joseph, I think he had four wives. And uh, uh, one of them was Danish, and you know, just all of it. And not only that, Joe was an interesting character, too. He was the youngest of the uh, eight boys of the original Julius. Mm -hmm. And he started out, I think, in Maryland at a school. Uh, a historically black school in Maryland, or I, it, the name of it doesn't come, it's not Morgan State, but it was, it was a little school, Lincoln, I think, Lincoln University. And he, he told me this, he, he didn't like that, and he, my, he's probably too far away from his people, you know, from home, he's just wandered off somewhere. <laughs> and he walked, he said, down to Tuskegee, where his brothers were. And his was the last class that Booker T. Washington was the administrator. So that's how far back it was. But his career, he said he was a Buffalo soldier. He said that his troop rode a thousand miles behind Poncho Villa. That's what he told right. me. And he never wanted to see a horse after that. <laughs> I don't blame him. But also, he worked for the post office. And he was a socialist mm -hmm. during the time when socialism was not, you know, too well received. Right. And um, so he lost his job at the post office, but he also sued the post office for that. And they uh, re reimbursed him. Really? <laughs> mm hmm So that kind of thing is, is what the family, you know, you just... You hear about it, you know, oh, you, you did that? Well, yeah, you yeah. know. And even in my generation, there are people who have done things that, you know, unless you ask them or read something, right. you just don't know they've done it. They just go ahead and do it. Right. And uh, you mentioned that teacher, you had me in a free spirit. Sounds like your family is full of free spirits. <laughs> I think you might be right. I think you might be right. Mm -hmm. Right. So independent. Right. And eccentric is not too, too harsh of a word, I don't think. Uh, we certainly are, um, I think we're a little different, <laughs> not by, by choice, but right. I think it's the genes, mm -hmm. I really do. It's interesting to know anybody was further back than him, you know, see how they were. It would be wonderful, you know? <laughs> I would love to know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we're just a little strange. I use that word strange. <laughs> and the world knows it. When you talk to people about freedoms, they'll, they'll, they'll indicate to you right. that there's just a little something there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> when I was in the fifth grade, my teacher, Miss Armstrong, had a frog in a jar that was so dead, so dry, so <laughs> long a fossil. And so she decided, you know, well, we'll open this jar or something. She, she taught my cousin Tim. See, that's another thing. That's a legacy thing, too. Because it was not only my grandfather and all his children, but then I had an older brother and an older sister. And all of that, and all those cousins. So you, you get all that when you say what, my, when I say what my name is, that recalls all of this other history that other people know. Right. See, that I don't even know they know. And she says, well, I know you, I was so saying, oh, I'll cut it up, I'll break, I know you'll break it up because Tim is your cousin and he would do anything. You know, people just go on and start telling you things that you never really knew. Right. So, that was it. Oh, yeah. Failure was not an option. Right. Among, among my immediate siblings. <laughs> Our parents um, were both, had both died by 1960, so, mm -hmm. you know, we were six very young children and um, it was it was you just understood it, that you you know you just have to do the best you can and, and make it it's like you were you were forced to learn things yourself in a way i guess well we felt the obligation to make something of ourselves to the extent that we wouldn't be a burden on anybody else I, that's that's the way right i was right at, you know so and, and we did that we worked we worked jobs, we worked um, agriculture, you know, we started working like eight or nine years old. We, we started, all of us started working around that age. And did all of you live with your grandparents? Four, the four or? oldest of us. Okay. And the two younger uh, lived with their, um, with my um, maternal family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. across the highway. Really? <laughs> yeah, are you and out in the country. Right. So we got a taste of all of that because we still remain close. You know, the people who raised us knew that we were family and, you know, siblings. And I would go stay in the country all summer and work in tobacco. And, and they would come to town and whatever. And so we were just, it was still all good. Y'all still all close to this day? I would say so. Really? I would say so. Kind of close like static, you know, when you get close enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were all close. Um, um, well, I was going to ask you, you know, if there's, you know, anything else that you can think of, you know, from when you grew up in this neighborhood area that, you know, might, you might think might be significant? I will say that the neighborhood has changed mm -hmm. geographically. Mm -hmm. It is not the neighborhood, the streets that we used to walk. Now, why is that? Because of this, this building and where it stands and mm -hmm. how that used to be. But it was dark. Mm -hmm. in East Wilson. Mm -hmm. There were no street lights, there was no pavement, and you can still see the airway houses. You familiar oh, with the yeah. airway houses? No insulation, practically on the ground. And when did Hines Street come through here? Do you remember? Hines that? Street was um, a devastation for this community mm -hmm. because it took half of Uncle Nessa's yard. Mm -hmm. And that, that was very devastating to his daughter who lived there. Mm -hmm. Because that yard was a show place. Mm -hmm. That was another thing. People's, people had yards, but they had this soft green grass. You know, they, they come from Tuskegee. <laughs> I've wondered looking at the pictures and everybody's talking about the bears and all that stuff they had. And then when I go over and look where the house is, I'm like, where did he have all this? Because it seems so tiny more. over there. It was right. More. And it was, even the house is, you know, it looks bigger on the outside mm -hmm. than it is. But the, um, the neighborhood. You had a few houses, one or two brick houses, but in some uh, home ownership, but for the most part, the slum lords had just, I was, they have to be millionaires. Mm -hmm. um, there's no way they would have lived the way they were allowing the people to live around that Freeman Place area right. and on further down Manchester mm -hmm. and New Bern Street and into, into other areas. And um, now it, it, it's just so much more open. Mm -hmm. 
And those, when you walk down Robertson Street, that street looks like it's about this wide, right. you know. <laughs> but then it was just, just it was all probably a path more <laughs> more than anything else as I look back at it. So you know, if you had an automobile, and that was another thing, my uncle from Washington would come and he would buy a new car. Mm -hmm. He worked at the uh, soldiers' home, the old soldiers' home okay. in D.C. Mm -hmm. And he, he bought, bought cars. And every couple of years, he would come down in a new, different car. <laughs> One year, he bought a Simca. Have you ever heard of a Simca? So, oh, but it was, it was, you know, this is something. And you see this orange car, right. you know, <laughs> barreling down the dirt road, the dirt and everything flying. That's Uncle Tooley, you know? <laughs> oh, God. Um, so, geographically, it's changed and, and I would say improved. Some of the houses are still there, some of them are boarded up. If you go further down, you know, you'll see that some of them are boarded up and they should be. I, I would love to see some of them preserved, mm -hmm. you know, just for cultural reasons. But, um, you know, I don't know how, how to say that people are poor or not poor, but the housing was not so good. Mm -hmm. And having come from living in that house with five bedrooms, mm -hmm. I was a kid, you know, I just did not know that everybody, and I should have, but I just didn't judge how other people live. Mm -hmm. you know, that's my friend, that's where they live. Right. You know, but you, you sleep in the kitchen, you know, it just didn't phased me then as a young child, but it probably phased other people and added to this expectation that if you lived in that house, and in fact, that's what I get this from my brother, he told me this, he said, so what do you think made all of the difference? He said the house did, and perhaps it did, there are other brick houses, but um, that might have been the thing that stood out to people somehow. So um, geographically, I think, it's, there's an improvement with getting rid of so much of the poor housing right. and the uninhabitable housing mm -hmm. that people had, you know, back then when I was in elementary school. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the early '60s mm -hmm. and and late '50s. I, I think it probably was not so comfortable. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did um, when they put 301 out there, did that? Change things too? Well, 301 was always there in my memory. Three, okay. Yeah, because you had to cross the highway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 301, we used to just walk across 301 like people do now, you know, just like you walk across Nash Street. Mm -hmm. We just walked across there when we would leave here. My, this house that I grew up in is, um, is uh, 1114 Washington. Mm -hmm. Well, when you get across the highway, it's the same, you know, you're just on the other side of the highway. Right. So, um, you just walked wherever you were going, and if you was on the other side of 301, you went on over there. Right. <laughs> just walked right on across the highway. How about that? I don't think I haven't asked a lot of people because we've been concentrating more in this area closer to downtown, but when you go over there about 301, were there a lot more businesses over there than what um, there are now? Yes, I think there were more businesses because 301 was a major thoroughfare. Until they built 95. Right. And um, there was, um, in fact, my uh, cousin's grandparents had a store. And uh, there was a little hotel there. And there was a little pub at, at one point. Yeah, I think there were more businesses that way. And a few down on East Nash, the barber shops and the pool room, um, another hotel, but you know, a beauty shop maybe. But um, that was about all of the business that I can remember. It, of course, the funeral home. Right. Of course, I know drive down East Nash now and on the way here, you know, you look off to the, to the right and it's just a lot of empty land out there. I mean, I'm sure you mm -hmm. remember when there were still a lot of, were there a lot of more businesses that were in that area? Were there yeah, more that, houses? the whole side of Nash Street, if you're coming east on Nash, mm -hmm. where Roses is or was, mm -hmm. Roses was thriving. I mean, we had McClellan's across the street from Roses, all the major dime stores. I don't think we had uh, Woolworths, mm -hmm. but we had McClellan's, we had Belts, we had, we had a couple of um, private, People like there were some ladies' dress shops mm -hmm. in there that were owned by families or individuals. 
But from roses, I think you had, there was a little, this shop was like a flea market. And it was the last shop before you hit the downtown, so-called, that you know, down. It separated East Wilson right. business mm -hmm. from West Wilson. And uh, there was just a little man who uh, worked, owned the store. I guess he had some of the cheapest junk you've ever heard of. <laughs> I don't know how you can make junk that cheap, <laughs> but it was cheap enough for you to afford. Right. <laughs> Glassware and just different things. Then there was the drugstore. We had Terminal Drugstore, the train station. So. I still remember Terminal. You do? Yeah, it just closed a few years ago. That's right. Yeah, so. And now the, I think it's the Methodist Church has opened up an ice cream shop mm -hmm. in there. So we'd have to go get some ice cream. But the First Baptist Church, down towards to to the train track, um, there were there were some businesses in there. Yeah, there were businesses all the way up to what is now the Museum of the Coastal Plain. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As far as you know, versus black owned businesses and white owned businesses, was there like a pretty much a line, or was it kind of intertwined? Well, the black businesses were service. Right. There was no commerce mm -hmm. as such. Nobody owned a store. Mm -hmm. Except, you know, maybe a little... We had little stores, what this generation would call it a convenience store. For us, it was just a little, little store. Right. My grandfather had one of those mm -hmm. for a little while after he uh, retired from um, Hackney Body Shop. It used to be Hackney Wagon right. Place, and now it's something else. He worked for them as a yard man. And when he retired, he opened up a little store, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a little. There was a little store on Nash Street here. This now gone mm -hmm. Curtis Sutton. Mm -hmm. Now he had a he, his store thrived. Mm -hmm. He had meat. He had you know pickles. He had food, produce, mm -hmm. and that you could get that in his store, like a grocery store. After his store closed, a man who had worked for him opened another store, which I think was on Vic Street, a little bigger store, but it was like a miniature grocery store. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you, unless you had a car, you didn't get to Piggly Wiggly or A&P. You just didn't go get up there. I don't know who shopped up there from this community. Right. Now, my grandmother got her driver's license in a car at the age of 60, which is another thing. 60 years old, she bought herself a car to learn how to drive. Well, we would drive up there, and she would take her friends. And they would go to, I think it was A&P where Pinky Wicked is, mm -hmm. or Win Dix is on there. So she probably started black folk going in there, right. you know. <laughs> I'll tell you something else about her. So the jeans may be on both sides. <laughs> she would go to people, they would ride at white neighborhoods mm -hmm. in her car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what was she driving, do you remember? She First she had a Galaxy, uh -huh. a Ford Galaxy. That was the first one that was used. Mm -hmm. And um, and she paid five hundred dollars that car. I remember holding the money, mm -hmm. and because uh, I wanted to see what it felt like to hold five. But after, after that, there were new cars. Right. So right. she didn't keep that for too long. But I don't remember what she. But she went to Chevy's after that. Right. Okay. And she probably had five. You know, and that probably picked up people's ears. Oh, that lady is <laughs> car. You know. Um, you said she just liked driving around those neighborhoods. She, uh, yeah, yeah. She, she drove around in those neighborhoods and she would stop and ask the people to let her go in the house. Really? And they would. Some of them would let her go in and look around and see, and I, I do that too. I don't go in strange houses. I don't do right. That. <laughs> right. But when I go to someone's house, I like to look around in the house. Right. <laughs> and just see what the house looks like. I think that's part of the building, the builder. Mm -hmm. uh, I think building is part of, I mean, you know, even my oldest brother, he, he's a builder. Mm -hmm. And um, several of my brothers, well, another one at least anyway, it's, it's kind of nice to see things built, paint and, mm -hmm. you know, nails and wood and that type of now, thing. Did you ever get anything like that yourself? Or? Well... I may have. <laughs> I may have a little iota of that right, in right. It somewhere. That's a different subject. Really? Okay. <laughs> but I do like buildings. Right, right. I like structures. Right. If I go somewhere, I want to see the buildings. Mm -hmm. Take it to the post office. Mm -hmm. Show me, you know, the bank. 
Mm-hmm. I don't care about too much of that other stuff. But right. I like to, I do like buildings. I sure do. A little bit of architecture in there. Uh, yeah. Just a little. Okay. Maybe so. Maybe so. <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. Was there anything that you wanted to add? I don't think so. To this, okay. I'm real curious about. Tell me the um, the socialist was your. He was a communist. And they, well, what's his relation? He is. Uh, he was Uncle Nestor's brother. He was my grandfather's brother, so he would be my uncle. So he was communist he was party. Uh-huh. Yeah. I was once communist party. That's why I'm curious. Okay. <laughs> Years ago, but. Um, yeah. Right here. In Wilson. Yeah. Didn't know they were that progressive. That wasn't uh, real popular in a lot of. I areas. can imagine not. Did he try to organize people? I'm not sure Remember? that he tried to organize or he was organized, but I can tell you he was outspoken, whatever he was. was. I'm sure he was. And he talked to you about those ideas? And not so much. This is, you know, when they would tell these stories, it would seem so like blasé. <laughs> to know? a child, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was yeah, in the pocket bar. You know, I, I had to sue them to get my money. You know, <laughs> you, but you don't yeah. visualize what right. all that involves. Yeah. Right. That's a that's a process, you know, that takes years, and it did take years. Yeah. yeah. But um, it is documented. What, what, I'm sorry. Uh huh. Where he, you know, the letters that they sent him back and whatever. In fact, I stopped up at Imagination Station on the way down here because yeah. there's a book that um, his daughter wrote. <laughs> you know, just a memoir. Yeah. And I, I had loaned it to them, and I really was going to try and get it back, but the lady was not up there, so I didn't get it back. And when was that? Would that be in the 50s? No, she would have written it in the probably.